episode number 22. You are listening to the More Than A Lawyer podcast with your host, Janine Esbrand. I'm here to help lawyers and mums to thrive in their careers and motherhood. I share tips, strategies and inspirational conversation with awesome women to help you reduce the struggle in your juggle. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share with you some information about a tool that I absolutely love, Audible. If you're anything like me, you love to read books and learn new things, and you probably have loads of books on your reading list, but finding the time to read those books is a problem. You're busy with work, you're busy with children, you're busy with projects, so sitting down to read through the pages of a book seems like a bit of a luxury. So if that's you, I encourage you to check out audiobooks with Audible. You can download the books to your phone or your desktop and you can listen to them while you're doing other things. So when you're doing your chores, when you're driving, commuting, playing with your baby, playing with your children, whatever it is you're doing, you can still read books and take in awesome information. It's absolutely fantastic and it's been a game changer for me since I signed up uh, for a membership a few months back. I've read so many amazing titles and and learned so much. So I've partnered with Audible to give my listeners a free 30 day trial. So you can download a free book and you can choose from a range of titles in their expansive library. And all you need to do is head over to www.lightboxcoaching.com forward slash audible to sign up for your free trial. Hello, hello, welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here with you today and to be introducing you to our guest, uh, who is an amazing woman. She's a lawyer, a mother, a diversity champion, a TEDx speaker, a board member, and so much more. Funke Abimbola has a really interesting and inspiring story, and we're going to be diving into that today. Um, She shares with us her journey into the law and the challenges that she came up against in the early years. Um, She told me about and she's telling you about how she made 150 cold calls in the space of two weeks in order to secure the placement that she needed to qualify as a lawyer now that is dedication Uh, we also dive into how clear boundaries are the key to her managing motherhood with all the other demands on her time Um, there's just some really golden nuggets in this interview and I, I'm sure you're going to be as inspired as I was so without further ado let's jump right in. Hi Funke thank you so much for being here today it is um, a privilege to have you on the show it would be great if you could introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a bit about yourself. Of course thank you very much for having me Janine. So my name is Funke Bimbola. I am a senior solicitor Uh, working for a very large company, the world's largest biotech company. Um, My role there is as general counsel, so I am the senior lawyer on site. And I also have financial compliance responsibilities as well, uh, newly acquired since January of this year, which is very, very unusual for a lawyer. But uh, again, just a really good way to carry on developing as a senior leader. Awesome. So, can you tell us a bit, uh, there's so much I want to speak to you about, um, but firstly, can you tell us a bit about your kind of journey to getting to this position? Because I know you've been uh, practicing law for a long time now and you've had a number of different roles in different settings. Uh, so can you I share have. a bit about uh, about the background of your journey to this current position? Definitely. So, I mean, doing law at all was was a real a break from family tradition because my family are all doctors. I come from a very aspirational, high achieving Nigerian, you know, middle class Nigerian background. So my father was a doctor, mother, three younger siblings are all medics, uh, all doctors. Uh, And I'm the eldest. So my father assumed that, uh, not unreasonably, that I would follow uh, that route. So it was a bit of a shock to him when I announced that Uh, I didn't want to become a doctor. I had to really, really put my case to him because he was funding school fees as a private, you know, privately funded school fees and all sorts of expenses. So I really had to convince him. Um, But in the end, he agreed for me to do 
to go on to do law uh, as an overseas student, you know, so it cost him a lot of money to educate me here. And um, I then went back to Nigeria for what I thought was going to be a summer break after graduation. And I ended up staying there for almost three years. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a long <laughs> Completely break. Completely un- unplanned. <laughs> um, a mixture of family, um, things were changing in the family, finances were a lot tighter. We had to prioritize my younger siblings, basically, for their education. So I ended up doing the Nigerian bar when I was in Nigeria, but always with a view to coming back to the UK. I'd been in the UK since I was eight. Uh, So this was very much my home and my friends were here and everything. I came back to the UK. I did the transfer test. Okay. And because of some of the experience I'd gained in Nigeria, I was able to reduce my training contract down from two years to just six months, which at the time was a major, major coup. Because if you think it's hard to find training contracts now, going back almost 20 years, it was even tougher. It was um, the tail end of a recession and there just weren't many training opportunities. So I had every reason to think I was well ahead of the game Mm -hmm. and that I only needed to find six months experience. And the biggest shock of my life was realizing just how hard It was to find the six months. And it was the first time I had experienced discrimination, blatant uh, discrimination because of my name. Nothing else added up. You know, I couldn't think of any other reason why with the right academics. I've been to a Russell Group University. I got really good grades. Uh, Why was it? And I realized it was because of my my name, Uh, because I was so desperate to to qualify. I had this cold calling campaign. So I wanted to become a corporate lawyer. Yeah. And a recruiter had the audacity to say to me that black women didn't do corporate law. Oh, he said it was too on. competitive. And, <laughs> oh. um, and I was very upset, but ultimately very, very angry. And um, to prove him wrong, I cold called the top 100 corporate law firms uh, in the UK and spoke to the senior partners, every single firm directly. And I managed to get interviews that way, basically. I had this sales pitch about myself, what I had to offer, et cetera. And I managed to get several interviews and uh, the six months experience that I needed that way. That so it was interesting. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's just so, so many people could have taken that as a, as a knock and just mm. say, well, I can't really break in because they're not accepting me. But the fact that you was like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that. I'm, I'm good enough to be doing this. And then coming up with that strategy and the dedication that it would take to make so many calls and go through rejection after rejection to then yeah. get to the place yeah. where you're actually accepted is, is, um, it shows, it shows that if you put your mind to something, you can absolutely achieve it. Definitely. I mean, I made it, it was 150 phone calls and over a two week period wow. uh, because I, I covered in-house legal teams as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I landed on my feet. You know, after all that effort, I, I got a, a role within a large uh, public company, very well known public company, fully listed. So, you know, it was fantastic experience. And they kept me on after the six months. So I was with them for almost a year. Awesome. And then I, I moved on to a corporate finance uh, niche practice. Uh, in central London and then another uh, central London firm uh, a medium-sized practice and then I had my son (laughs) oh amazing so you just you just need that one person to open the first door and then things can just start absolutely from there and I'm still in touch with the lady who gave me the first job you know we still catch up regularly because I owe her so much you know she gave me a chance basically I say to people all the time that you can make such an impact on other people. One person can make such an impact. Um, I remember Mm -hmm. for me, I was, when I was applying for training contracts, I was finding it extremely difficult to um, get to the interview stage. And I had done so many applications and I had a really good bank of experience. I just wasn't understanding why I wasn't getting to the next stage. And a friend of mine introduced me to somebody who was also, I knew of her, but I didn't realize she was a lawyer as well. Um, and she looked at my application form for me and she basically talked to Shreds and said, you're just not doing this right. You're just not selling yourself. You're, this this is rubbish. Um, and it was hard to take, but I took on board her comments and I rewrote it. And then I ended up getting three interviews 
after that. So wow. it, was, it was the fact that she took the time to go through it line by line and sent me a, a full on document with track changes all over it to show me where I was going wrong. But without her doing that, I wouldn't have known. Nobody, nobody mm. was there to guide me. So um, similar to you, I, I, I'm always grateful to her for, for taking that time out and investing that time and energy into to me and the opportunity. Mm. So, um, but yeah, you mentioned that you, that, that after that, you then went on to have your son. So talk to me a bit about that transition, because there's a lot of um, listeners who are either transitioning into motherhood or they're at the beginning stages Mm -hmm. of juggling their legal career with motherhood. How did you find that practicing as a corporate lawyer um, and, and raising your, your son? Well, that was the second wake up call. So the first one was uh, having the sort of racial discrimination really at entry level. Yeah. Uh, and the second wake up call was realizing the the cost, you know, to, of your career, really, uh, in terms of having maternity leave for a year. I mean, I was completely naive. I was married at the time. I was 28. I thought everyone surely is having children at mm-hmm. this point in their life. You know, <laughs> it never crossed my mind that people would plan where they'd have their children or friends of mine were waiting till they became partner and then they'd have their families. So I ended up being the only junior uh, assistant solicitor with a baby at the firm because right. everyone else was waiting and all the other mothers were much older than I was. You know, Their children were at university. They were already partners of many years standing. So it was a real shock. You know, I came back um, after a four years maternity leave. I'd effectively lost a year's PQE, even though on the roll, I still had a year. Yeah. I came back to my peers. Of course, they'd gained a a year's more more experience than I had. And it was horrendous. The firm wasn't ready to support me in the way that they should have been. They'd never had someone returning to work in that way. I was the first asked to work flexibly in those circumstances how, in the history of the how firm. Was that, how was that received? I wanted to ask you about that because flexible working now is a much bigger topic and people are, mm-hmm. it's at the forefront um, and firms are seeing that they need to try and accommodate. But I guess mm-hmm. at that time for you, that wasn't the case. So how did they It wasn't at all. Respond? I mean, the law had only just changed to allow you to give you the right to ask. So right. literally the law had only just changed. That gives you an idea of how long ago we're talking about. Um, so I was the first person to ask under this new <laughs> legislation. And what I very quickly realized was it was impossible to make it work because mm. Firstly, I was working in central London, doing very large deals, transactional, cross-border, et cetera. Yeah. And um, it just wasn't going to work. The the long hours culture, corporate life in central London is very, very different to when you're in the regions. Yes. Um, But I I did almost give up on my career at that stage. You know, I did think this is too difficult. And I was trying to, I was always rushing around. You know, I found that I was rushing to get my son to nursery, rushing to get into the office early, rushing to leave by five to then pick him up on time, panicking if the tube was delayed yeah. or, you know, because the nursery would start charging horrendous penalties. Uh, after a certain time, it was £10 for every minute that you were oh, late. Wow. Um, I got an au pair in the end because I realized I, you know, we needed the live-in help. But even that didn't really, really help because, of course, I'd get home from work in the evenings and I'd want to take over then. You know, I'd yeah. want to give him his bath and everything. Um, but I was just constantly tired and I realized that if I didn't change the sort of practice I work for, I was actually going to give up law altogether. Yes. So I made one of the best moves ever to move out to the regions. Mm-hmm. I moved to a regional firm in the northern home counties and actually moved out of London uh, altogether to Hertfordshire. And it was by far the best move I could have made. I was able to drive to work. There was no traffic. Um, It was easy to, you know, I had more energy for my son because I wasn't doing such long hours. The hours more regular. The clients were more SME type clients rather than large corporate organizations. So they also had families they wanted to get back home to. It was a very, very different culture. Yeah. Um, that was a good move. But I I, I suppose I, I looking back now, what I was doing was my career plateaued for a while because I made the conscious decision 
to prioritize family life yes and to just keep my career going it was great experience in the regional firm but it wasn't the high flying you know central london yeah uh, practice i'd had before but it was a conscious decision i didn't want to miss out on those years with my son yeah and that's something that i talk to people about all the time because um a lot of lawyers say, well, you know, you can't have it all. And I think you can, but you, but it's at different stages. So exactly. there, there, there is a period where you will want to prioritise family life and you will want to make sure that you're there in the early years for your children before they go to school. And then, then there will come a time where they're a bit older and then you can, you can ramp it up again with your career but you don't have to walk away from it completely there's a way that like as you've described where you can figure out how to do both well um but it might just look very different from from how life looked before you you had your child definitely and having good quality child care as well you know that that's the key I mean I, I've always worked full time um I've always worked Monday to Friday um you know five days a week I've Mm. never had four or five days because I chose to do corporate law and because of that it was very difficult to do three days or two days at home or whatever Um, but the quality childcare and live-in help if you can have it I think is by far the preferred option when your child is ill for example and the nursery phones and says you need to go and pick up your child I actually realized how unfair that was on my colleagues if I kept having to disappear and you know, to pick up a child, I thought if I have someone living in, they can, the can go and pick him up, man the fort for a few hours, and then I can get home and take over. And that, again, was the choice I made. It's not for everyone. Yeah. But I realized that that was a choice that I could actually live with at the time. Yeah, it, t- it totally makes sense. And I think it takes that taking a step back and just thinking about, well, what's going to work for me and my family and you know exactly. what, what I want and then pursuing that so not necessarily thinking well you know I must I must go the nursery route or I must go the nanny route it's what what's going to work for you and what sits well exactly. with you exactly. as a as a family so um yeah that's awesome and then so you went from there to then going um in-house how did you I find did. the the transition from private practice to in-house so I've made that transition myself after having my son because I was working mm. in corporate law and then um after him after I had him and went back I decided to move in-house and it's very different way of working <laughs> mm, it <laughs> and, is um a, a very different um approach to practicing law and I I really enjoy it I love it I love the fact that you get so close to the business and Mm -hmm. the the kind of um more thinking about the risk element as opposed to just just the law so um how have you found it and and you've you've been working in-house for a long time now so for a long time yeah well I started off in-house of course um the six months you know experience to qualify was actually in-house yeah So that's where I started. Um, But I I much prefer it. I mean, for me, it was very important to work uh, for a life sciences company. I I work for a biotech company because of my medical history in the family. You know, I I'm surrounded by doctors and medicine is very much a part of our lives. So for me, I found even in corporate practice, in in private practice, I was advising lots of healthcare um, clients because I really understood the way the NHS worked and and things like that. So for me, it was perfect uh, to move to my current organisation because law and medicine could finally meet Mm. and I could have both combined. Um, So the transition hasn't been, wasn't bad for me. It was a very welcome change. I prefer the pressures I have working in industry compared to the constant pressure to bill um, in private practice, which I think rewards inefficiency because you just record time there's so much pressure to have chargeable time on the clock yeah so write off as little time as possible and so on what you find in house is that there's much more of a focus on personal development mm. as being a core part of um you know your your overall development and leadership training and because it's it's commercial you know it's a truly commercial environment you get very very involved with the strategy and driving that forward um i'm on a senior you know, up, up, you know, board level yeah. in the organization as well. So you get to see that helicopter view of the organization. 
Uh, it can be challenging to manage expectations. Uh, I think you're very accessible in the house. Mm -hmm. So where you could sort of hide when you're in private practice, if you saw the phone number flashing and it was a client <laughs> you weren't that keen to talk to at that moment in time, you could actually ignore the phone and call them back. Yes. Of course, if you try that in house, the person will show up physically. They'll just at come your to your desk. desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's true. <laughs> So uh, I'll follow you into the toilets, which happens to me all the time because um, people catch me as I'm rushing to the loo and think if That's I grab her now, I can get some quick advice. I mean, it's ridiculous, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's great. And I, I love the fact that you've been able to kind of blend your interest in the uh, in the medical field and, and that that area of your of your life and your your family history has combined with the legal side because uh, I think sometimes as lawyers we, we think okay I'm a lawyer so I should be doing this but actually you can find ways to blend some of your other passions into the work that you do on a day-to-day um, mm -hmm. and when you do that I think it makes it for much more enjoyable um, experience when you're practicing in an area that, that really lights you up I guess. Definitely. And for me, you know, being able to impact the lives of patients is amazing. It's wonderful that I didn't have to do medicine. Oh, yeah, yeah. To ultimately, you know, get, get that aim. But that's what the organization is all about. It's, it's a healthcare company. It's all about enhancing patient care. And um, it's incredible, uh, the work we do. Really, really awesome. Yeah, I, I, I've seen I've seen some of the um, I, I have been on the website and I have have had a look and it definitely is um, I like the ethos of the company and, and what it stands for. So that's awesome. Um, I know that you do so much. So in addition to your um, practicing in house and and leading up the team and then being a mum, you also do a lot of work championing diversity and in schools and stuff so yeah as someone who has so much on her plate how do you manage it how do you juggle it and and, mm. and what advice could you give to others who want to do a lot with their career mm. and want to give mm. back and want to um, contribute to the community um, it'd be great to hear about kind of the strategies sure. that you that you implement yeah I mean, the first thing is to have a very, very clear why, you know, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. It is so important to be doing it with the right motives, uh, to be really passionate about what you do, because you're, you're far more likely to um, find the energy that you need sometimes to actually add this to your already very, very busy life. So your why is really, really important. Uh, and for me, it really is my calling. I mean, I, I, I believe very strongly in levelling the playing field. I do work around race, gender and also social mobility, mm -hmm. almost exclusively within the legal profession. But of course, it has a ripple effect with corporates and so on. Yes. So start, starting with your why is important. Having said that, being very, very clear with your boundaries. So, for example, at any given time, I'll have about 20 people that I'm mentoring. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I've got 20, 20 mentees, but I'm very careful to have mentees at different stages in their development because the more junior you are, the more support you'll need. Right. You know, you need a lot more confidence building and coaching and so on. So I have a number of school, you know, school kids that I mentor and a couple of uh, newly qualified solicitors and one trainee, but I'll never have more than maybe five or six early stage um, mentees because right. if I had 20 of them I mean that would be really really hard going mm. so I do things like that make sure that I balance that I because I don't actually live in London and a lot of this activity is actually in London uh, I'm in Parliament, Law Society and all these institutions are actually in London. It takes quite a while for me to get to London from where I live. Mm. So I limit myself to just one event a week uh, that involves a trip into London, which forces me to prioritise which event is going to have most impact. Yes. So next week, for example, on Thursday, I've been invited to three events just on Thursday night. And I've chosen one because at this point in time, that is the one that's going to have the biggest impact. I, I am very careful with weekends. It is almost unheard of for me to have a speaking engagement or any kind of diversity related um, event on a weekend. I, I probably only go to two or three things a year on the weekends. Weekends are for my son. 
family downtime, time for me. Um, it's very important to have that downtime. When I go on holiday, I don't check my emails, but I'm contactable. So what I say to my team is text me if you need my help, but I won't be checking the emails. Call me if it's an emergency. So that way I'm not constantly checking the emails and thinking, oh, I should just have a look at this, check yeah. this, drop this, drop that. But they do know I'm there if they need to. And they will call. You know, they have called a couple of times. So that's far better than having the constant reading of emails, which means you just don't really switch off when you're on holiday. Um, but having said all of that, there are certain months that are very busy, like March is International Women's Month. Hmm. So the the one event a week rule, I know in March is just not going to work. I mean, in <laughs> March, I had about, I think, 10 or 11 events, all of which, <laughs> I mean, one of them was going to Downing Street, so I couldn't turn that down. Wow. Uh, one one of them was um, meeting Liz Trust and interviewing her, you know, et cetera. So there were things that I had to really dig deep and find the energy. March was utterly exhausting, but I knew that April would then be a very quiet month and I was going on holiday in April. And I always plan it that way, knowing that March is incredibly busy. Yes. Likewise, October is very busy because it's Black History Month. So I've already been booked for five events in October and I know there'll be more as we get closer to October, so I'm always very careful to have a quiet September and a quiet November because I know October is going to be really, really busy. There's going to be lots of things going on. Um, so I'm very conscious of trying to get the balance right. I have a lot of mindfulness, you know, meditation type stuff as well, just to get my mind uh, in a, a balanced state of frame of mind, really. Mm. Um, I switch off completely from work. It's very rare for me to be working, you know, in the evenings. I'd rather wake up early to work yes. than in the evenings because I can't sleep if, you know, I've been looking at files or whatever um, just before bed. But working early in the morning, sometimes before going to the office actually really works for me. So that's what works for me. It's having very clear rules, very clear boundaries and being aware that because I volunteer my time, some people will take that for granted. You know, I don't charge for any of my time. I've never charged for any of my engagements. And increasingly, there are people who do think, you know, it's freely available and therefore you should always be able to go to their events. So it's also learning to say no without offending people. Uh, yeah. And just saying, I, I actually cannot do that. For me to do this means I can't see my son or, you know, there's some sacrifice. There's always something else you could be doing in the evening, right, than traveling into yeah, London. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but because I'm so passionate about it, and that's why I say your why is so important, it really energizes me. I'm speaking to 800 school children on Thursday morning. I cannot wait. You know, it's just... Um, I just love it. I love looking at their faces, seeing that light bulb moment, knowing that I've said something that's really resonated with them, hearing the feedback afterwards. It's wonderful. It energizes me, actually. So I'm very passionate about it. Yeah, I, I can totally relate. When when I work with um, clients one on one, so I do coaching with lawyers um, and just the, when you just mentioned that light bulb moment, it's amazing when, you know, you, you help someone to come to a realisation that something's possible um, and and seeing them then process that and know that they're going to be able to act on that is just it's so rewarding. You can't you can't really describe it um, unless you've experienced it. So I know I know what you mean. Um, and it's it's great what you all that you shared in terms of the, the tips and the the strategies that you use um, are fantastic, and I think what jumps out at me is the fact that you're really clear with your with your boundaries. Um, and it, it, when you when you set your boundaries, you it's kind of a filter, so you know that if opportunities come up, you have to filter them through and realize that if you're saying yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. So exactly, um, just being clear on what's what's the most important thing at that given moment. Um, and then, yeah, being able to say no is is definitely um, it's. I think it's definitely a skill that needs to that 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 needs to be developed, and you get used to definitely. being able to do that. Um, but I also like the fact that you you kind of have an overview of your year, and you know when it's going to be busy, and so you mm. can you can make sure that you're planning accordingly instead of just going with the flow 
and allowing things to just take over um mm. it sounds like you're just really intentional about things which which is definitely how people need to approach it it, it is very much about forward planning uh, and the other thing is my son is older now um and from the age of nine started coming with me to the event oh, so awesome. he started networking he's one of his best friends is a senior partner in the city i mean it's one of the most surreal relationships I've ever seen in my life. But 50 year old guy, my son, best buddies. They got on like is, a house on fire. How old five. is your son? He's 14. Oh, bless. That's so sweet. It's, it's just, and they met when my son was nine. And it's just, it's wonderful to see. It really is wonderful. Um, so he's been to with me to Parliament, for example. He's uh, been to several speaking events. Uh, it's actually his school that I'm speaking at on Thursday. Uh, morning uh, as well so um, I involve him as much as I can now because he's at an age where he can really really appreciate it yeah and it's been great for him as well for his confidence yeah of you course. know networking he knows how to work a room you know he's yeah, very very good age, at networking that's amazing. <laughs> and it's, it's so Wonderful. nice because it's it's something that you're, you're so passionate about and you enjoy but then it's also um, something that you get to share together and so mm. look, when when he's older and looking back on experiences, it's going to be lovely to be able to say, you know, I did this with my mum and, and we used to do these things together. Um, so I, oh, I love that. I think it, <laughs> it's, it's so easy to compartmentalise our lives and, and feel like, well, I'm in mummy mode now and I'm, I'm doing my volunteer stuff and I, I'm doing work stuff. But it doesn't always have to be in, in separate categories. So um, that's really nice to see. And, and what's amazing is he he signed up to um, he for she, you know, UN Women's. Um, yeah. yeah, he actually signed up to that because he he realized that the girls needed support with their confidence. And he thought, what can I do to, you know, and he was already actually convincing, the you know, boosting them up, I guess, in term, purely in terms of the confidence, because he could see they were very, very capable, but they just lacked confidence, whereas the boys were actually probably not as capable as the girls. And there's lots of data that, that confirms at school that girls are actually academically more more capable, but they lack confidence. So the yes. boys take more risks. They'll put their hand up in class. They don't care if it's the right answer. They'll just give it a go, whereas the girls will not put their hand up unless they're sure it's the right answer. Yes. So he started supporting the girls, saying, just put your hand up. You know, even if it's the wrong answer, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Um, um, and that came because of what, you know, the influence I'd had on his life. You know, he feels very passionately about women's rights and oh, their boys nice. he doesn't hang out with at school because they disrespect the girls. You know, it's it's just it's wonderful to see. So uh, that gives me a lot of joy as well. Yeah. So he's a, basically a, a lovely young man. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you've done a great job, it sounds like, with him, which is awesome. Um, he has his moments <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm sure as a teenager <laughs> um okay so it's been oh I've learned so much from you just from having this chat and I'm sure everyone else has um one thing I like to ask guests on the show is just uh, about whether or not there's a, a quote or a mantra or, or um something that they've read or heard that has stuck with them and that they like to kind of either live by or share with others um mm. Is there anything you, you can think of that, that comes to mind? Sure. I mean, there are several. But the one that I really, really like is if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. Yes. I think it's all about really knowing what you stand for. Um, because if you don't, you can just end up sort of going with the flow and not really knowing what your purpose is in life. Again, it goes back to understanding your why. Mm -hmm. So I often say to people, you know, what are you actually standing for? Because if you don't know that, you'll fall for absolutely anything that's going. Yeah, that is such good advice. Such good advice. And in terms of knowing your why, um, there's a there's a TED talk by um, Simon Sinek, which. Yes. Might, yes. Yeah. So I, I love that TED talk. And so when you talk about finding your why, I think if people are, are thinking about how do I figure that out, um, that that TED talk's a great inspiration. Um, so I advise people to check that out. But if if anyone wants to kind of learn more about the work that you're doing and um, perhaps connect with you, wh where would be a good place to, to do that? I think I, I um, sure. you have a website, right? 
I do have a website, which is uh, funkairbimbola.com. So it's um, just just my name, basically. Yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter. So Twitter is probably the best way to find out which events I'm speaking at. Okay. And my Twitter handle is at diversitychamp1. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is uh, a very, very good way uh, to keep in touch with me. And yeah. that's just Funk Air Bimbola. Uh, it's very obvious it's me. There's pictures that look like me. <laughs> so it helps. <laughs> you need a picture on LinkedIn, then you definitely have that a nice one. looks like you as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there are pictures that look like me. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm very active on social media. So that's a very good way to find out where I'm speaking at next or generally what I'm doing. Great. So I'm going to put the links to that in the show notes, which will appear on my website. So if um, anyone's listening, they just want to go and click, um, they can they can do that. But um, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been great speaking to you, learning more about your journey. Um, and yeah, I wish you all the best with everything that you're doing in the coming months. Thank you very much, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. It was truly a pleasure to speak to Funke. It's amazing what determination, dedication and intention can do. I really like the fact that her son is so involved in her work and that him being involved from a really young age has benefited him and her and their relationship. Um, It's just a great example of making it work and how your work as a lawyer can definitely integrate with your family life and if you are intentional about it and you set yourself clear boundaries you can absolutely make it work and have um, a lifestyle that you that you enjoy Uh, but if you are thinking I have no idea how she manages all of those things and you are struggling with balancing work and family life right now why not sign up to my free resource library for female lawyers which includes resources to support you in your journey as a working parent so head over to lightboxcoaching.com forward slash resource library and sign up it's um, a work in progress there's some resources in there already and I will be adding to them on a regular basis it would be great to connect with you in the being more than a lawyer Facebook group Um, it's a safe space for lawyers to come together connect and share and support one another on this journey called life Um, so head over to lightboxcoaching.com forward slash facebook and then you can get the link to the group Uh, that's it for today ladies I look forward to connected with you again next week and don't forget if you are enjoying the show if you are liking the topics that we're talking about please do leave a rating and review in iTunes so that more women just like you can find the show and also share it with your friends tell people about the podcast so that we can spread the word and the being more than a lawyer movement can spread far and wide it is great to um, speak to you once again and I will be back next week bye the more than a lawyer podcast features music by Ben Sound